Hey everybody, this is Ed from the Whiskey Tantrum Podcast here with another one of our crazy classic quick taste <laughs> with a very, very special whiskey that Ooh. Scott's going to tell you all about. That's right. As soon as I pour something else to drink before. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's that bottle this way. Oh yeah, here. Uh, that's the bottle on the left hand mm-hmm. side. Yeah, we're recording this right after uh, St. Patrick's Day and I bought some Teeling small batch and it comes in a nice tin now. It's really nice. It's only 40 bucks. Very yeah. reasonable. Well, that's a great price. I've seen as high as 48 but Oh yeah. The reality is it's the one that's finished in the rum cask. But it's really good. Yeah, so uh, what we're doing tonight, however, is the Hirsch Cognac finished cast strength bourbon quick taste. Whiskey short. This is something that Ed got for his retirement gift from teaching very recently. Um, yes. Joe, who has been on the podcast in a Scotch episode, mm, God, almost two years ago, yep. he reached out to me. He gave me a price range and then asked me for suggestions. And this was one of the suggestions well, I gave him. And my other friend, Joe, at work also had a big part in procuring this as well. He's the one that actually went to yes. the Nash. And so I thank both of them. They gave me also the new Lewis single barrel, which was featured in uh, this year's Whiskey Madness. Yeah. And made it to the semis. Yeah, and we have a couple more that we'll be doing quick tastes uh, yeah. for the next couple months. Right. But the Hirsch, cast strength, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, finished in 30-year-old cognac cast. So this is cast that had held cognac for 30 years. Yeah. So the assumption is it's going to have a lot of flavor when you put in the whiskey. I think it's probably the nicest bottle I've ever had in my house. Yeah. We have a pretty nice one in our locker, but that's a whole other story. Might be the nicest one that we've featured on the podcast. Yeah, that probably is. Yeah, because we don't normally spend this type of money. No, the Thomas H. Handy's probably the... Oh, the, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a very small sample. Very small we sample. didn't have a whole bottle. Right. So this is the nicest full bottle that we have <laughs> on the podcast. It's, it's the nicest bottle quick taste we've done for yeah. sure. Yeah. So Hirsch, I knew that Hirsch was... Well, I suspected that Hirsch was a real person. Yeah. And I looked up who he was and... Man, this is just one of those stories, Mm -hmm. just like all the other deep distillery dives that we've done in the past where everything's Williams and uh, incestuous whiskey business. Elijah Craig, all these people that actually did stuff. What was the one from uh, James E. Pepper? That was an interesting story. James E. Pepper, that was an interesting story. Bad whiskey, but good story. (laughs) Right. So this is like that. And if you're a whiskey nerd like us, Mm. you're going to love this story. Here we go. Lay it on us. All right. Born in Germany in 1908, Adolf. You know, he was born a long time ago. (laughs) Yeah. Adolf H. Hirsch emigrated to America on board the USS Cleveland, bound for New York City during the height of Prohibition. He was just 17 years old. Mm. Several years later, after settling in Chicago and finding work at an investment bank, he would become a U.S. citizen and make a career move that would alter the course of whiskey history, perhaps not for the better. Because when he was just 26 years old, his uncle... Isaac Wolf Bernheim asked him to come to work for him at his Bernheim distillery in Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. You've got to be kidding me. Nope. Which would later be purchased by Shenley in the 1930s and then much later by Heaven Hill in the 1990s. Hmm. And if Isaac Wolf Bernheim sounds familiar, we told his whole backstory on part one of our sourcing whiskey mentory because he created the whiskey brand I.W. Harper, Mm -hmm. which we featured on that episode. He also set up a trust for the Bernheim Forest where cousins Fred Booker No and Parker Beam played as children. Anyway, as a result of the Shenley purchase, Hirsch left to pursue his own distilling business, purchasing the Pennsylvania Distilling Company with three investment partners and renaming it Logansport Distilling. In 1946, Hirsch would end up rejoining his former company when Shenley purchased Logansport, but Hirsch would only stay for a year, basically retiring at age 38. That would have been nice, right? Yeah, it took me 55, and I, <laughs> and I feel like I'm getting out early. Yeah, I'm 55, and I... He loves his work. <laughs> if you love your work, everybody, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> so cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. Yeah, that's true. It is true. Yeah. <clears throat> that's why we want to make the podcast what we do. Right. If that can be a full time job. Right. So Hirsch would come out of retirement a few years later and serve a four year term as executive vice president for Shenley, but then would retire for good in 1960. And that's where one might expect the Adolf Hirsch whiskey store to end. Except it didn't. Mm. It would continue in the most unexpected way, eventually portending, perhaps even creating, the conditions that drive the insane secondary market pricing that exists exists today. Interesting. You see, in 1974, Hirsch innocently commissioned 400 barrels of bourbon, some say it was as many as 800, from the Penco Distillery in Schaeferstown, Pennsylvania. He initially had no real plans to use the whiskey because he did it solely as a financial favor to his friend who ran the distillery. Unfortunately, the favor didn't help much. Penco was shuttered, and then a few years later, it was bought by Michter's. 
And for the truly wild tale of Michter's, go back and listen to episode 42 for one of the best brand stories ever. Mm-hmm. In any event, when the original incarnation of Michter's Distillery eventually closed its doors in 1989, Hirsch's whiskey barrels were still there, just sitting where they'd been for the past 15 years. Hirsch himself, now an elderly man, figured it was probably time to sell, but thought that he might not be able to find anyone willing to take what was then considered to be overaged whiskey. Luckily, his old distilling contest at Shenley put him in touch with Gordon Hugh, who was fresh off having launched a little thing called Van Winkle Family Reserve Mm -hmm. with his friend Julian Van Winkle III. Together, they acquired all the barrels from Hirsch and after tasting how well they turned out, decided to bottle the bourbon and sell it as A.H. Hirsch Reserve, which by now was a 16-year-old whiskey that they dumped into steel containers to halt the aging process. However, they did set aside some barrels to continue aging up to 20 years. But despite how delicious the whiskey was, it did not immediately fly off the shelves in the United States. Thus, a substantial amount made its way to European and Japanese drinkers who were craving American whiskeys with longer age statements. However, as rumors of its high quality intensified throughout the 1990s, bottles quickly vanished into whiskey faults or down drinkers' throats, and collectors began to pay top dollar to get back the older releases from Europe and Japan. In 2003, Van Winkle facilitated the bottling of the rest of the 16-year-old bourbon at Buffalo Trace, which is when prices really exploded. Basically, what happened was the Pappy phenomenon before the Pappy phenomenon. Right. In fact, so exalted was the reputation of A.H. Hirsch Reserve, and so hard to come by that famed whiskey writer Chuck Cowdery published a book about it titled The Best Bourbon You'll Never Taste. Mm. Indeed, today, if you Google A.H. Hirsch Reserve, you'll see the ridiculous prices that range from $4,000 to well over $10,000. And for the even more limited 17, 18, 19, and 20-year expressions, up to $40,000. But as all this was going on, Gordon Hugh ended up selling the brand to Price Imports, who would in turn be bought by the Griffin Group, who placed the Hirsch brand in the portfolio of the previously acquired San Francisco company Anchor Distillers. Mm -hmm. And thus, it is today that the revived Hirsch brand pursues the perfection of its namesake whiskey by sourcing, blending, finishing, and bottling award-winning bourbons from the likes of MGP and Willet. Mm. I love stories that dovetail with all the tales that right. we told before on the podcast. And Hirsch was not even something that came up in the Michter story. No, no, not at all. And then, so when did Hirsch die? Do you have that? Uh, I don't. But he lived to a ripe old age. But it, I didn't have any information on when he actually died. He is dead now, though. You're sure? Yeah. About like 125. No, because or... he was born in 1908. So he'd be he'd be 115. <laughs> They know sometimes whiskey keeps you preserved. Oh, that's true. So this whiskey in particular is sourced. It's a cast-strength Kentucky straight bourbon finished in 30-year French oak casks that once contained XO cognac from Thomas Hine and Company, a 260-year-old cognac house that also has a story, but we don't need to get into we that. We don't have the time for we, that. We don't have the time for that. And it's just Elena's drinking the damn Hirsch. Right. So its proof is 127. The mash bill we have is 72% corn, 13% rye, 15% malted barley, the age is six years plus another year and a half in the cognac cask Mm. it's probably will it this mash bill its parent company anchor distilling now called holding company or something Mm -hmm. but they own dingle irish whiskey writer's tears anknock aaron and spayburn scotches nika from japan Mm. kavalan from taiwan and a bunch of tequilas mezcals gyms right you know but Mm -hmm. also the hein cognac whose barrels were used to finish this particular whiskey the price is about $200 MSRP, and mm-hmm. of course, we didn't buy it because Ed got it for his retirement gift. Right, but I do hear it was about between 2 and 210 Yeah, something around there. And, that, and that's about right. They didn't overpay for that. Right. That's right where it should be. Right. Quite, well, we'll Ooh. be the judge of that. <laughs> so we got this chilling in our neat glass Ooh. with the caps on. We do a little bit of a light swirl to get the flavor profile bustling. Once again, I will say, as I often do, if you have not joined us on the Neat Glass Party, please go to neatglass.com, and if you put in Whiskey Tan in the code, you'll get 10% off your first order. So you might as well get six. That's what I say. (laughs) Take advantage of as much discount as George wants to give you. I'm so excited to do this, because I sort of had an ulterior motive when Mm. Joe asked me about whiskeys. I was like, well, what whiskeys would Ed like? And then secondarily, which one should we have on the podcast? Oh, yeah, I knew you had an axe to grind in this, for sure. I'm like... (laughs) Oh, it's a very interesting note. It's not as sweet as I thought it was going to be based on the high corn and the fact that it's been finished in cognac cask. Yeah, I agree. It's it's, that, it's there. I get a little note of vanilla on it and all that, but it's muted. It smells a bit more like you might expect a rye to smell. And it's also, you know, I mean, the neat glass is amazing at diffusing the ethanol like we know. But for this yet, proof, yeah. there's not a lot of heat. I expect more heat from something that's 127 proof. Right. But you can kind of smell some of the heat yeah. because it's so high. Oh, what's that interesting scent? It's sort of uh, like a 
uh, good and plenty. Oh, like a little licorice? A licorice, but like, like a sweet, sweet licorice, mm. yeah. Which are, oh shit. Oh. It. <laughs> oh, wow. Ooh, peppery. Oh yeah, really, really delicious, sweet forward palate with most just sugar and vanilla and caramel, right? Like an explosion up front. And then quickly travels through, through the palate to the finish, which is very medium, sustained with pepper and spice. Yeah, it goes through a nice uh, baking spice transition to something a little deeper there. I, I'm getting a little anise of two that I was getting on the nose. You're right, though. It starts out very sweet. I just put five drops of water on because I think this is made to be opened up at 127 proof. Yeah, if you take a bigger gulp, it's a little harsh. Yeah. And you don't really need it to be that yeah, harsh. Just the harsh and harsh. <laughs> is it harsh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just five drops of water took this to a whole nother level. Much more vanilla, much more caramel. The palate has been extended a bit. It's a much slower burn. Oh, yeah. It mellows it out quite nicely. It has a nicer mouthfeel, almost, with the water in it. Yeah. It has such deeper, darker flavors to it, like almost like a molasses or something. Because mm, yeah. it's got a sweetness, but it's like... A little funky extra dark brown sugars and but right. like spiced brown sugar is that a thing they're gonna pour some more yeah i went through that a little fast Ooh. Ooh. I, tell I you mean what. it's powerful this is a powerful whiskey and that's what i'm saying it's why i believe it's made to be proofed down a bit is because it's supposed to last you at 200 plus dollars a bottle it's not supposed to need as many of these you know as if you're drinking an eagle rare at 90 or something or are, a basil hate at 80 are you getting any like cognac specific notes mm, like, like a point. grapey there's so much going on in the beginning I, didn't, I haven't really looked at the finish as much as i should yeah yeah let's try that it's like a really heavy whiskey yeah like on your tongue and in your mouth Ooh. man it's it's a lot going on it's yeah it's a little hard to describe almost even though we've been describing it pretty well <laughs> i feel like we still haven't gotten to the it keeps actual, changing yeah i just took another sip and i tasted stuff like i actually got a little bit of like a leather mm. And a little herbaceousness that I didn't get earlier. Yeah. And the so, more water you add, the more complex it yeah. gets. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. I'm taking a sip and I'm adding two, three more drops. I'm that's taking what a I'm sip doing too. and I'm adding three more drops. And each one changes the sip. This is not one that I would sip neat just yeah. right out of the bottle. You, know, you might actually do this on a globe. You never do globes either, but I can see you doing a globe on this. Uh, I, yeah, maybe. Because, you know, a, a small one. A small one. Not, yeah. yeah. Not the real big not one. That, yeah, the giant ones. So, yeah, maybe yep. like Or a, maybe even a cube. Inch and a half. Maybe one cube. Yeah. Like just one regular cube you might like on that. All right. So, are we finished with our tasting notes? Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Let's see what they said. Let's okay. see what they said. I'm interested to see because I bet they're tasting a lot of stuff that I didn't because I felt a little overwhelmed by this whiskey. Yeah. There. Whiskey wash on the nose, warm chocolate, wildflower honey, molasses, and toasted brown bread with bright citrus and floral notes that evoke Szechuan peppercorns, as well as vanilla bean paste, maple sugar candy, and an earthy note like chopped fresh button mushrooms. All right, well, I mean, if that's <laughs> wow. label, if that's what I labeled as tobacco and leather, then okay. But I, <sighs> I don't care for mushrooms as a rule, so that's why I would not probably choose I mean, that. earthy, I don't know about the button mushrooms, but earthy I can get. Uh, yeah. Yeah. maple sugar candy I guess we got kind of got that warm chocolate I didn't really get mm -mm, I didn't get any cocoa in this molasses I kind of got all right, so on the palate, a fiery kick of sweet, juicy pears, graham crackers, and a savory character like a pinch of tomato paste mm, interesting savory like tomato paste Mm. I associate tomato paste with like oregano and the like Italian spices. There is a little bit of a salty acidity to it. So like I could see how some people could pick that up. Yeah. Yeah. On the finish, lingering tannins with notes of roasted green tea. Who fucking roasts green tea? I mean. Puffed rice cereal and vanilla. I'm glad that the barrel spirits guy is, is, <laughs> working moon, for is moonlighting at Whiskey Wash now with his Szechuan peppercorns and his uh, <laughs> roasted green tea. And his fresh button mushrooms. I know. I Chopped. mean. Chop, they have to be, yeah. I feel sometimes they do it to impress each other. Like, oh, you know, like, yeah. oh, let breaking bourbon suck on this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Szechuan peppercorns yeah. breaking bourbon. Take that. I, I know, because know. people don't know the difference between peppercorns and Szechuan peppercorns. Like, I know there's probably a difference, yeah. but how different is it? And maybe, you know, the reviewer could come back and be like, it's not my fault, Ed, that you haven't traveled <laughs> around the world trying peppercorns. Well, that's, like I that's also true. But I'm speaking for, like, the average drinker. And in fact, if you <laughs> listen to our last call, you heard how many whiskeys we've tried. 
right? Yeah. So it's not like I haven't been doing my homework, Whiskey Wash. I'm doing the best I can here. And I still have never had a Szechuan peppercorn. Yeah, it's a lot. All right. It's a lot. Okay, so the other Hirsch whiskeys, uh, they only have three others that they put out mm. uh, regularly. They have something called the Horizon, which is 92 proof. Mm -hmm. It's a blend of two whiskeys, 94% of which is a five-year, 75% corn bourbon, and only six of which is an eight-year, 60% corn bourbon. Karma Vanilla lay the base with hints of oak, tobacco, and custard underneath. That's only 40 bucks. Very reasonable. The Bibwhac. Bibwhac. Bird. 100 proof. The blend is a 95% of a three-year, 74% corn bourbon and 5% of an eight-year, 72% corn bourbon. Summer fruits, vanilla, light fresh oak, white peppercorn spice with whiffs of cinnamon and peach. Right. You see that white peppercorn? See that? I've had white peppercorn. Yeah. I have white peppercorn in my house. Yeah. All right. I can stick one up both nostrils if I want. You know, I don't have my house Szechuan peppercorn. Yeah. That's my point right there. I'm completely with that review. You're not Chinese. I don't think it has anything to do with the Chinese. I mean, they're allowed to have whatever peppercorns they want. Right. That's what I mean. But you're not Chinese, so that's why you don't have them. So what? Are these peppercorns grown in the Szechuan province of China? Yeah, they're Szechuan peppercorns. Maybe they taste like every other peppercorn. They're just grown on a different ground. <laughs> Maybe. So Russian peppercorns read like the same thing as my peppercorns? <laughs> Poppycock? <laughs> but there's too much pepper in my peppercorns. <laughs> Better be proud to partake of your Szechuan pie. Get us out of here. Come on. Just keep All right. It. Finish uh, it up. The Hirsch single barrel is a 125 proof. Yeah. It's aged six years or more. The mash bill is the same we have here. 72% corn, 13% rye, 15% malted barley, dark cherry, roasted caramel, cinnamon, herbs, soft pepper, and finishing with sweet chocolate. That's $90. And we actually had that right. on Doug's Vault. And by the way, we ranked that very high. We did. So just as a public service announcement, I love the fact that we were able to drink this. But going back into the world of Hirsch, same proof point, a year and a half younger without the cognac barrel, I might get the $90 one. Yeah, Scott. I think I might also. I don't think this is better than that for having been finished in the cognac. I don't think it's $115 better. Okay. You know what I'm saying? That's a fairer statement than what I said, because right. it might be better. We'd have to taste them side right. by side, but it's certainly not $100 better. Right. So Absolutely. maybe one night we just knock on Doug's door with this bottle. <laughs> hey, Doug. Doug what, are, what are you doing? We got a couple of neat glasses here. <laughs> Let's just try them side to side. We'll be out of here in 15 minutes. Right. Hey, Sue. Good to see you as always. <laughs> hey, it's kid. Don't get up. Don't get up, kids. wife, Sue. Yes. Yeah, don't get up, kids. Everything's fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> Your daddy's whiskey <laughs> friends are here, but we're not here for three hours. Right, we're, we're just like, coming for a quick two drink taste. That's right. All right, I don't know. Final thoughts? I think we already gave her final thoughts. I want to thank everybody that I worked with for splurging on such an amazing bottle for yeah, me to it's, try. It's very nice. I'm uh, surprised they actually got that one for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I should tell that when they gave me the Nulu in this, it was in a wooden wine box with straw on top. Did you think it was wine? No, because what they did is they sprinkled a couple of fireball oh. airplane bottles on top, <laughs> and I thought it was filled with airplane bottles of fireball as oh, a joke. Oh, shit. So I thought it was a joke gift. So yeah. I started laughing, and I held up the two fireball bottles. I'm like, oh, my God, you guys are so dumb. And then I moved the straw, and I saw the Nulu first. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, whoa, I, this is a nice whiskey. It is. And then I saw the Hirsch, and I was like, my heart stopped a minute because I knew what it was yeah. right away because it was always on my bucket list, meaning like if I could find someone who likes me that had it and talk them into giving me a drink. Oh, yeah, the doers retire. Right. <laughs> and so if you have the money and you want to try the Hirsch finished in the cognac, it's about $200 plus. Dollars. It's very interesting. But if you want to jump into the arena for half that, the single barrel, six year, same proof, same mash bill, $90 is probably the entrance point for yeah, you. Yeah, that's probably a better price. And that's probably where I'll go back to visit Hershey again. And I really want to compare both of them together before we kick yeah, this bottle. All right. Definitely. All right. So for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, thanks for listening. I'm Ed. I'm Scott. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Later. Later.